How many receptacle outlets on the countertops or work surfaces are required on the 20 amp small appliance branch circuits in a kitchen? And the correct answer is as many as required by the layout. The NEC mandates that there must be a sufficient number of receptacles to serve the countertop, but it doesn't give a specific number, like an exact number, but it instead gives us a prescription for how to achieve the proper amount. And that number depends on the layout of the kitchen. If you answered two to today's question, you're likely referring to 210.11c1. Let's take a look at the paraphrase code language. In addition to the branch circuits required by other parts of this section, at least two 20 amp small appliance branch circuits must be provided for all the receptacle outlets that are specified in 210.52b. So here in this section, it requires there be two circuits, but that's not how many outlets there are. Remember, an outlet is the utilization point at where it comes out. And the moment we put a receptacle on it, it all of a sudden then becomes a receptacle outlet where the power comes out at. Now let's take a look at the requirements for the countertops. This is the paraphrase code language. In kitchens, dining rooms, breakfast rooms, pantries, and similar areas of dwelling units, receptacle outlets for countertops and work surfaces that are 12 inches or wire, wider must be installed according to 210.51 C1 through C3. These outlets are not to be counted as the receptacles that are required in 210.52A, which are our general receptacles. What this is stating is that every countertop that is 12 inches or wider is going to have at least one receptacle outlet. And then it goes on down through the code to give you the prescription, which we call the two, four foot, the two foot, four foot rule. And I have videos explaining that. If you'll head over to electricalcodecoach.com, you can check out our free version of our exam prep. And remember, if you need anything from me, you can just email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it. Which of the following materials is not allowed for grounding electrodes? And the correct answer is aluminum rod. While aluminum is a super versatile material and very integral to the electrical industry, there are a few cases in the NEC where it's actually prohibited, and this is one of them. When we head over to 250.52b2, we're going to find that aluminum is not permitted as a grounding electrode due to its susceptibility to corrosion, which could compromise the grounding integrity. When we head over there, there are a few things that we are not allowed to use as a grounding electrode. B1 is metal piping systems for underground gas. We don't want to use those as part of the grounding electrode system. Aluminum is specifically called out. And then structures and structural integrity of reinforced steel and the steel that is referenced in 680.26, which of course is our pool equipotential bonding grid. We're not allowed to use any type of the pool structure as part of our grounding electrode system. When securing equipment grounding conductors, grounding electro conductors, or bonding jumpers, which of the following methods would be a violation? And the correct answer is using a machine type screw fastener that engages one thread. Let's take a look at the feedback. The NEC requires that machine type screw fasteners engage at least two threads or be secured with a nut. A fastener engaging only one thread does not provide adequate security and would be a violation. Let's take a look at the paraphrase code language. In 250.8, the following methods are allowed for connecting equipment grounding conductors, grounding electroconductors, and bonding jumpers. And this is paraphrase code language. Pressure connectors that are listed, terminal bars, pressure connectors listed for grounding and bonding purposes, exothermic welding, which is CAD welding, machine screws that either engage at least two threads or are secured with a nut, thread forming screws that engage a minimum of two threads within the enclosure, connections that are an integral part of a listed assembly, and any other listed method. Of course, consult the actual NEC for the specific code language. What size copper conductors would you select for a 2 horsepower, 115 volt AC single phase motor terminating to 75 degrees C terminals? 
And the correct answer is 10 gauge wire. Now for this one, we have several steps. When sizing normal motor conductors, you will use the FLC, which is the full load current, values from table 430.248 for single phase and table 430.250 for three phase. Then you're going to multiply that FLC by 125%. Then we're going to use our primary opacity table to size our wire based off the column that the question states the terminals are rated for in degrees Celsius. Let's walk through it step by step. First, we're going to head to 430.248 because our question specified single phase. We're going to find our horsepower on the left, which was 2. We're going to come across the top and tee off with our voltage. And then when we drop down, it's going to let us know our FLC. That's going to be our starting value. Then, according to NEC 430.22a, the conductor supplying a single motor must have an ampacity of not less than 125% of the motor's full load current rating. So we take our original 24 amps, we multiply it by 1.25, and that is gonna equal 30. Now we need to head to our primary opacity table. And once we get there, we're gonna start on the left-hand side because the question specified copper, and this is the copper side of the table. We'll come down here on the left-hand side, or excuse me, the easier way to do this question, we're actually going to do it in reverse. We're going to start at the 75 degree C column and then come down and find our first wire that will cover our known load, which is 30 amps. And we're going to find that when you get to 12 gauge, it's only good for 25 in the 75 degree. So we're going to need to upsize that to the next size, which is good for exactly 30 amps. And that's going to be uh, our wire that we choose. And then we need to slide over and we're gonna find out that it's actually a 10 gauge wire. What size copper grounding electrode conductor is required for a 200 amp service with two watt copper service conductors? And remember, the grounding electrode conductor is the wire that goes from, we'll say the ground rod, to the service enclosures. And the correct answer is a number four. Now, anytime we're dealing in the exam prep world with a question about grounding electrode conductors, we have a qualifying question. Does it mention the type of electrode? Meaning, does it say when using a ground rod, when using a oofer ground, or whatever? In this case, the answer is no. And in the absence of knowing the electrode, we're going to default to table 250.66 and use it at face value which we're gonna do in just a moment and walk through the process of answering this question. If the question does mention the type of electrode, as an example, a ground rod or an oofer ground, we're gonna first go to section 250.66A, B, or C and see if our type of electro electrode is mentioned in the text. And if it is, that's where we're gonna find the answer to our question if it does mention the type of electrode. Now let's go ahead and answer this question. What size copper grounding electrodes conductor is required for a service with two watt copper service conductors? Does it mention the type of electrode? No, so let's go ahead and head to table 250.66. This is where we're gonna size all of our grounding electrode conductors. We always will start on the left-hand side and select from the column of the composition of our service conductors themselves. So on this side, it, we have two watt copper service conductors. So we're gonna start here and we're gonna go down the copper column until we find two watt wire or whatever range that two watt wire falls in. Then we're gonna cross over to the other side of the table and we're gonna look back at our question and ask what type of metal is the grounding electrode conductor itself? And the answer is copper in this case. It wants us to size a copper grounding electrode conductor. So we're gonna select from the copper column and what we would do is follow from this side over, we'd find two odd on this side, slide over to the copper column, and we're gonna find that it's required to be a number four. I am the electrical code coach, and my bargain is that these videos will add value to you, and you will in turn add value to others. If you'd like to learn about this very large subject that we break down in a very easy to understanding, understand way, you can head over to electricalcodecoach.com, click on the free version, and go to week 10. That's where we cover this topic here. By the end of it, you'll be a pro at sizing all three different types of grounding conductors, which include grounding electrode conductors, 
equipment grounding conductors, and bonding jumpers. Let's get to it.